Hi everyone, welcome back to a new episode of Diagnose Dan. Today we are working on a 2016, I believe, BMW X1 diesel. And the customer complaint is that the check engine light is on. So let's see what's going on and let's diagnose it together. So let's start up the car and let's confirm the customer complaint. And the car starts right up. But it looks like we don't have a check engine light right now. So unfortunately, no check engine light. So maybe folks, this customer is a liar and he wants to spend his money on us chasing a problem that's not even there. Well, of course not. Yesterday, when he brought this car into my shop, and I thought it might be an interesting case for a YouTube video. I actually saw that the check engine light was on. So I confirmed it myself. Unfortunately, I can show it to you right now, but you have to take my word for it. In the next step, let's hook up a scan tool. Let's see what fault codes are stored and let's take it from there. So I hooked up the dongle to the car and I turned on the ignition. As a common practice, I usually hook up a battery charger to the car so we don't have to worry about battery voltage while we are diagnosing the vehicle. In this video, we'll be using the Top Don Phoenix Max, which I hooked up to the big screen. And I can't really tell you a lot about the tool yet because it literally came in two days ago. But for the ones who are interested, I will keep you updated. It does come with a four channel oscilloscope, which is really cool. And what I can tell you, it's that it's the coolest looking scan tool I've ever seen in my life. I scanned the entire vehicle for fault codes, but of course we are really interested in what fault codes are stored in the engine computer. Well, we actually have got eight fault codes stored in the engine computer. So let's go in there, let's see what fault codes there are stored, and let's take it from there. So let's read fault codes. And let me quickly go through the fault codes. And actually, six out of the eight fault codes that are stored are for the EGR valve. And actually the last two that are stored are really interesting because the last two tell us, and can somebody please tell me why I feel like a weatherman right now? But anyway, the last two fault codes for the EGR valve tell us, uh, e exhaust gas recirculation valve mechanically faulty near open position. The other fault code tells us exhaust gas recirculation valve mechanically faulty near closed position. And the other interesting thing is that all fault codes are intermittent and that might explain why we don't have a check engine light right now. Six out of the eight fault codes that are stored are for the EGR valve. The other two are for an O2 sensor and let me quickly check. Uh, the 288B00 power management standby current violation and that's basically a parasitic draw and that's not causing her issues right now. The fault codes that are stored for the EGR valve, none of them are electrical faults. They're all indicating there's something mechanically wrong with the EGR valve like stuck open, stuck closed, uh, airflow through EGR too high, too low and position faults. So I really think that sometimes the EGR valve gets mechanically stuck. We can do a lot of tests with the EGR valve on the car, but as you know, the fault is intermittent, so the fault might not even act up. So I really want to do a thorough visual inspection. It might be clogged up with soot. It might get stuck mechanically, but the problem is it's buried way in there. So what I want to do in the next step, I want to take it out and do a bench test and really take a close look at that EGR valve. I removed a lot of parts from the engine and bit by bit we're getting closer to the EGR valve. This is the EGR cooler and at the back on the top of it is the actual EGR valve itself. So we're not there yet, but we're getting close. Oh. 
Now, once you've reached the EGR valve, so once you've created enough space, it's actually not that hard to remove. There are only two bolts holding it down, and there are two coolant lines, which I pinched off to avoid a mess. But you have got to keep in mind that the two bolts holding the EGR valve down, <clears throat> so these two are T30 security bolts. So you will need a special T30 security socket with a hole in it to be able to remove those two bolts. Now you can clearly see that the EGR valve is quite dirty. There's quite a lot of soot and carbon buildup on that shaft. Now what I think that happened is that every time that valve retracts, it takes some soot with it in between the axle and the bore it's riding in, making it harder to move over time and intermittently it might even get stuck. I quickly took a look at a wiring diagram and our EGR valve is actually a five pin valve. Three of those pins are for the position sensor, a positive, a negative and a signal wire. The other two wires are for the driver motor itself. Now what I did is I hooked up an EGR driver to those two pins and hooked that up to a power supply, which is a booster pack. That way we can manually control the valve and see if it's operating as it is supposed to. When I turn on the power supply and rotate this dial, the jar valve should retract. Now, when I turn the dial back to zero again, the jar valve should extend again. Now, the extension of the valve is not done by this tool. It's actually done by spring tension inside the jar unit itself. So, when we apply power, the jar valve retracts, but when no power is applied, a spring should push the valve back out again. Now let's turn on the power supply and let's see what happens. And the valve retracts, but it doesn't come back again. Let's retract it, but as you can see, it doesn't return to its extended position. Now, just like we suspected, there's nothing electronically wrong with our EGR valve. It's just mechanically stuck because of the suit in between that axle and the shaft it's riding in, just like the fault code told us. Now there are two ways to fix this problem. One is to clean the valve, but inside that bore is very hard to reach and there's always a chance we don't clean it sufficiently and we get a comeback. Now a new valve, option two, is 150 euros. Now it's much more expensive just in labor time to replace it if I get a comeback. So for warranty reasons, I'm gonna replace it with a brand new one. But if it's your own car, go ahead and try to clean it. Now this is a brand new EGR valve and let's see how it's supposed to work. Let's turn on the power supply and let's rotate the dial. It retracts and it extends again. Let's retract it and let's extend it again. Now to show you that the extension is bound by spring power, I'm gonna retract it Remove the power and you see it comes back to its original position. Now, although I'm not going to take the time and try to clean the old valve, I do think it's pretty interesting to see what's going on on the inside. So I removed these screws holding the cover down. So let's remove the cover. Wow. And you can see that the suit made it all the way through that bore into the inside of the mechanism of the EGR valve. Wow, just look at that. All the soot made it through that shaft. So if you want to clean it, you've got to clean it all the way. Made it into the gears and to the motor. Just look at this. Wow. Now just for fun, let's see if we can get this valve unstuck again. Because the fault code told us that the fault was intermittent. So it shouldn't be stuck all the time. Well, that's really, really stuck. I don't know which way I should turn. But there we go. 
Wow, and I've got it working again. Well, <laughs> kind of. Now inside the box of the new Eat Your Valve was a note. Now on the note it says, wow, well first of all, I don't know if you can see that, but first of all, it says right over here, it says Rheinmetall. Isn't that the company that makes the leopard tank? <laughs> I guess that makes this EGR valve bulletproof then. But on the other side, it says mounting instructions. Now what do technicians do when they see a note with mounting instructions? Exactly, because sure enough, we know how to tighten two bolts. Installing an EGR valve is easy, right? Well, wrong. If you're not familiar with this type of EGR valve and you're gonna install it without reading the instructions, and remember, manufacturers don't put the instructions in the box for no reason. If you're going to install it without reading the instructions, you're gonna need to buy a new EGR valve, again, again, just as long until you've read the instructions. Now the new EGR valve is actually extended a little bit too far to be able to fit into the hole it needs to go into. Now you can't push back on the valve because in between that valve and the motor are these little plastic gears. Now if you put it in the hole and bolt it down anyway, you're going to crush those little plastic gears and you're going to need a new EGR valve and a new one and a new one until you realize what you've done wrong or read the instructions of course and no you won't get your money back from the supplier because they know exactly what you've done wrong now that's why in the original bmw diagnostic tester there's a special function called installation position of the egr valve now that retracts the valve far enough to safely bolt it down now this is quite a specific special function for a limited range of vehicles so i think this is the ideal opportunity to put the Phoenix Max to the test. We'll have this specific special function that can help us safely install our EGR valve. Now let's go into special functions and let's select drive, which is the engine and transmission. And there are a lot of special functions in here, but let's see if we can find the right one. Installation of the exhaust gas recirculation valve. Let's hit the button, let's see what happens. And there's some text, intended purpose of this service function, it's necessary when installing EGR valve to prevent damage to the EGR valve when screwing down the bolts. Really a lot of detailed information over here. Let's hit continue and let me zoom you guys in. When I hit F1, the EGR valve should go into its service position. So watch really closely, I'm gonna hit F1. Oh yeah, and it did it. Really impressive job by the top down. Phoenix Max. Now obviously I still got to build everything back together, but I'm pretty sure we solved that intermittent sticking EGR valve problem. Now I still got an O2 sensor problem and possibly a parasitic drain because we had a fault code for it, although I didn't hear the customer complain about a dead battery. But I promise you, if it's something interesting, I will bring you along in my next video. Now a little bit of homework for you guys, you can answer this question in the comment section during regeneration of the DPF. Should the EGR valve be closed or should it be open? For now, I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please subscribe to my channel. And when you hit the little bell, you will get a notification each time I upload a new video. And remember, diagnose then, fix it again. See you next time, guys. Well, folks, a quick update. I took a look at the O2 sensor fault and it turned out that the O2 sensor had very high resistance within the heater circuit. So it didn't heat up, it didn't come online, so I had to replace it with a brand new one. About the parasitic drain, that has to do with an aftermarket alarm system that was fitted to the vehicle, which does take some current when the car is off and the car does see it, but the current is very low and the customer doesn't have any problems with it, so we're not going to address that right now. Now, I've been driving the car for about 45 minutes. It's totally warmed up. So let's see. As you can see, no fault codes stored.
I quickly took a look at a wiring diagram and our EGR valve is actually a five pin valve. Three of the pins are for the position sensor. So a positive, a negative and a signal wire. The other, po the other poof in a five pin valve. Three of those pins are for the position sensor, a positive, a negative and a signal wire. The other poof, come on. I quickly took, 